followed by Sonnet 13. you do, but you must join in souls to mock me too. If you were men, as men you are in show, you would not use a gentle lady so to vow and swear and but super praise my parts when I am sure you hate me with your hearts. You both are rivals and love Hermia, and now both rivals to mock Helena? A trim exploit, a manly enterprise to conjure tears up in a poor maid's eyes with your derision. None of noble sort would so offend a virgin and extort a poor soul's patience, all to make you sport. Here live. Against this coming end, you should prepare. And your sweet semblance to some other give. So should that beauty which you hold in lease find no determination, then you were yourself again after yourselves to cease, when your sweet issue, your sweet form should bear. Who lets so fair a house fall to decay? which husbandry and honor might uphold against the stormy gusts of winter's day and barren rage of death's eternal cold? Oh, not but on thrifts, dear my love. You know, you had a father. Let your son say so. Thank you. followed by Portia's monologue from Julius Caesar, Act Two, Scene One. When I consider everything that grows, holds in perfection but a little moment, that this huge stage presenteth not, but shows where on the stars in secret influence comment, when I perceive that men as plants increase, cheered and checked even by the self-same sky, vaunt in their youthful sap at height decrease, and wear their brave state out of memory. Then the conceit of this inconstant stay sets you, most rich in youth before my sight, where wasteful time debateth with decay to change your day of youth to sullied night. And all in war with time for love of you. As he takes from you, I engraft you new. Within the bond of marriage, tell me, Brutus, is it accepted I should know no secrets that appertain to you? The I yourself, but, as it were, in sort or limitation, to keep with you at meals, comfort your bed, and talk to you sometimes, dwell I but in the suburbs of your good pleasure. If it be no more, Portia is Brutus's harlot, not his wife. I grant I am a woman, but with all the woman that Lord Brutus took to wife, I grant I am a woman, but with all a woman well reputed, Cato's daughter. Think you I am no stronger than my sex, being so fathered and so husbanded? Tell me your counsels. I will not disclose them. I have made strong proof of my constancy, giving myself a voluntary wound here in the thigh. Can I bear that with patience? 
and not my husband's secrets. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Ken Casillas. I'll be performing Titus's monologue from Titus Andronicus, Act 5, Scene 2, followed by Sonnet 130. What would you say if I should let you speak? Villains, for shame you could not beg for grace. Hark, wretches! How I mean to martyr you! This one hand yet is left to cut your throat, swells that Lavinia between her stumps doth hold the basin that receives your guilty blood. You know your mother means to feast with me, and calls herself revenge, and thinks me mad. Hark, villains! I will grind your bones to dust, and with your blood and it I'll make a paste. And of the paste a coffin I'll rear, and make two pasties of your shameful heads. And bid that strumpet, your own hollow dam, like to the earth, swallow her own increase. This is the feast that I have bid her to, and this the banquet she shall serve it on. For worse than Philomel you have used my daughter, and worse than Procne I will be revenged! And now, prepare your throats. <laughs> Lavinia, come, receive the blood. <coughs> My mistress's eyes are nothing like the sun. <laughs> Coral is far more red than her lips red. If snow be white, why then, her breasts are done. <laughs> if hairs be wires, black wires grow on her head. I have seen roses damask, red and white, but no such roses see I on her cheeks. <coughs> and in some perfumes is there more delight than in the breath that which my mistress reeks. <laughs> I'd love to hear her speak, yet well I know that music hath a far more pleasing sound. I grant I never saw a goddess go. My mistress, when she walks, treads on the ground. And yet, by heaven, I think my love is rare as any she be lied with false compare. Thank you. Hi, my name is Catherine Kors, and I'll be performing Sonnet 29, followed by Juliet's monologue from Act 3, Scene 2 of Romeo and Juliet. When in disgrace, with fortune in men's eyes, I all alone will weep my outcast state, and trouble deaf heaven with my bootless cries, and look upon myself and curse my fate, wishing me like to one more rich in hope, featured like him, like him with friends possessed, desiring this man's art and that man's scope, with what I most enjoy, content at least. Yet in these thoughts myself almost despising, happily I think on thee, and then my state, like to the lark at break of day arising, from sullen earth sings hymns at heaven's gate. For thy sweet love remembered such wealth brings, that then I scorn to change my state with things. Shall I speak ill of him that is my husband? Oh, poor my lord, what tongue shall smooth thy name when I, thy three hours wife, have mangled it? But wherefore, villain, didst thou kill my cousin? That villain cousin would have killed my husband. <coughs> back, foolish tears, back to your native spring. Your tributary drops belong to woe, which you, mistaking, offer up to joy. My husband lives, that Tybalt would have slain. And Tybalt's dead, that would have slain my husband. All this is comfort. Wherefore weep I then? Some word there was. War, sir, 
than Tybalt's death that murdered me. I would forget it, Fane, but oh, it presses to my memory like damned guilty deeds to sinners' minds. Tybalt is dead. And Romeo? Banish it. That? Banish it. That one word. Banish it. Have slain ten thousand Tybalt's. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kainoa Dahl, and I'll be performing a monologue from Hamlet, Act 1, Scene 2, followed by Sonnet 113. Oh, this too, too sully flesh melt. Ah, and resolve itself into a two. But that the everlasting had not fixed his cannon against self slaughter. God, God, how weary, stale, flat, and unprofitable seem to me all the uses of this world. Fie on it! Ah, fie! It's an unweeded garden that grows to seed. Things rank and gross in nature possess it merely. That it should come to this, with two months dead. Nay, not so much, not two. So excellent a king that was to this Hyperion, to a satyr. So loving to my mother, that he might not beteem the winds of heaven visit her face too roughly. Heaven and earth must I remember, why she would hang on him, as if increase of appetite had grown by what it fed on. And yet, within a month, let me not think on't. Frailty, thy name is woman. Since I left you, mine eye is in my mind, and that which governs me to go about doth part this function and is partly blind, seems seeing, but effectually is out. For it no form delivers to the heart of bird, flower, or shape which it doth latch. Of his quick objects hath the mind no part, nor his own vision holds what it doth catch. For if it see, the rudest or gentlest sight, the most sweet favor or deformest creature, the mountain or the sea, the day or night, the crow or dove, it shapes them to your feature, incapable of more, replete with you. My most true mind, thus maketh mine eye untrue. Thank you. Hi, my name is Skylar Dysars, and I'll be performing Benedict's monologue from What You Do About Nothing, Act 2, Scene 3, followed by Sonnet 36. May I be so converted and see with, with, with these eyes? 
I cannot tell. I think not. I will not be sworn. But love may transform me to an to an oyster. <laughs> but I'll take my oath on it. Till, till he have made an oyster out of me, he shall never make me such a fool. <laughs> One moment is fair, yet I am well. Another is why? Yet, I am well. Another virtuous, yet, I am well. But so all these graces, being one woman, one woman shall never come into my grace. <laughs> Rich he shall be, that's certain. Wise or, well, none. Virtuous or not never cheap in her. Fair or I will not look on her. Mild or come not near me. Noble or not for I, an angel of good discourse. <laughs> an excellent musician, ooh, ooh, and her hair, oh, her hair. It shall be of what color it please God. <laughs> Prince, and monsieur love, I will hide me in the arbor. Let me confess that we two must be twain, although our undivided loves are one. So shall those blots that do with me remain, without thy help by me, be born alone. In our two loves, there is but one respect. Though in our lives, a separable spite, which, which though it not alter love's soul effect, yet, yet doth it steal sweet hours from love's delight. I may not ever more acknowledge thee, lest my bewailed guilt should do thee shame, nor thou with public kindness honor me, unless thou take that honor from thy name. But please do not so. I love thee in such sort. As Oh, being mine, mine is like you before. Thank you. Seven. <laughs> Hi, my name is Mika Hashimoto, and I will be performing Sonnet 138, followed by Cleopatra's monologue from Antony and Cleopatra, Act 4, Scene 15. When my love swears that she is made of truth, I do believe her, though I know she lies, hmm. that she might think me some untutored youth, unlearned in the world's false subtleties, thus vainly thinking she thinks me young, although she knows my days are past their best. Simply, I credit her false speaking tongue. On both sides thus is simple truth suppressed. But wherefore say she not she is unjust? And wherefore say not I that I am old? Oh, love's best habit is in seeming trust, and age and love loves have not years told. Therefore, I lie with her, and she with me, and in our faults by lies we flattered be. No 
more was e'en a woman, and commanded by such poor passion as the maid that milks and does the meanest charms. It were for me to throw my scepter at the injurious gods and tell them that this world did equal theirs till they had stolen our jewel. All's but not. Patience is sottish, and impatience does become a dog that's mad. Then, is it sin to rush into the secret house of death, ere death dare come to us? How do you, women? What? What could cheer? Why, how now, Charmian? My noble girls. Ah, oh, women. Women, look. A lamp is spent. It's out. Good sirs, take heart. We'll bury him, and then what's brave, what's noble? Let's do it after high Roman fashion and make death proud to take us. Come away. This case of that huge spirit now is cold. Ah, women, women, come. We have no friend but resolution in the briefest end. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kaylee Hayashida, and I'm going to be performing Sonnet 116, followed by Tomorrow's Monologue from Titus Andromachus, Act 1, Scene 1. Let me not, to the marriage of true minds, admit impediments. Love is not love, which alters when an alteration finds, or bends with the remover to remove. Oh no. It is an ever-fixed mark that looks on tempest and is never shaken. It is the star to every wandering bark whose words unknown though his height be taken. Love is not time's fool, though rosy lips and cheeks within his bending sickle's compass come. Love alters not with his <coughs> brief hours and weeks, but bears it out, even to the edge of doom. If this be wrong, and upon me proved, I never writ, nor no man ever loved. Stay! Roman brethren, gracious conqueror, victorious Titus, through the tears I shed, a mother's tears in passion for her son. And if thy sons were ever dear to thee, oh, think my son to be as dear to me. Sufficient not that we are brought to Rome to beautify thy triumphs, and remain captive to thee and thy Roman yoke. But must my sons be slaughtered in the streets <coughs> for valiant doings in their country's cause? Oh, if to fight for king and commonweal were piety in thine. It is in these. <coughs> Andronicus, stain not thy tomb with blood. Wilt thou draw near the nature of the gods? Draw near them then, and be merciful. Sweet mercy is nobilities true badge.
Grace Noble Titus. Spare my firstborn son. My name is Mariko Jursak, and I'll be performing tomorrow's monologue from Titus Adronicus, Act 1, Scene 1, followed by Sonnet 76. <coughs> Stay, Roman brethren! Gracious conqueror! Victorious Titus! Rue the tears that I shed! A mother's tears! passion for her son. And if thy sons were ever dear to thee, oh, think my son to be as dear to me. Sufficeth not that we are brought to Rome to beautify thy triumphs and return captive to thee in thy Roman yoke. But must my sons be slaughtered in the streets for valiant doings in their country's cause. If to fight for king or commonweal were piety in thine, it is in these. Patronicus, stain not thy tomb with blood. Wilt thou draw near the nature of the gods? Draw near them then, being merciful. Sweet mercy is nobility's true badge. <coughs> Thrice noble Titus, spare my firstborn son. Why is my verse so barren of new pride? so far from variation or quick change? Why with the time do I not glance aside to newfound methods or to compound strange? Why write I still all one, ever the same, and keep invention in a noted weed, that every word doth almost tell my name, showing their birth and where they did proceed? Oh no, Sweet love, I always write of you. And you and love were still my argument. So all my best is dressing old words new, spending again what is already spent. For as the sun is daily new and old, so is my love, still telling what is told. Thank you. Hi, my name is Elsa Moore, and I'll be doing Gertrude from Hamlet, Act 4, Scene 7, and Sonnet 66. There is a willow grows a slant scant of the brook that shows its hoar leaves in the glassy stream. There with fantastic garlands did she make of crow flowers, nettles, daisies, and long purples that liberal shepherds give a grosser name, but our cold maids do dead men's fingers call them there. On the pendant boughs or cornet weeds clambering to hang, an envy sliver broke. When down her weedy trophies and herself fell in the weeping brook, her clothes spread wide, and mermaid like a while they bore her up, which time she chanted snatches of old lauds, as one incapable of her own distress, or like a creature, native and endued unto that element, and long it could not be, to let her garments heavy with their drink, hold the poor wretch from her melodious leg to muddy death. Tired with 
all these for wrestle death, I cry as to behold desert a beggar born and needy nothing, trimmed in jollity and purest faith unhappily forsworn and gilded honor shamefully misplaced and maiden virtue rudely strumpeted and right perfection wrongfully disgraced and strength by limping sway disabled and art made tongue-tied by authority and folly doctor like controlling skill and simple truth miscalled simplicity and captive good attending captain ill tired with all these these would i be gone save that to die i leave my love alone thank you 11 Good afternoon, my name is Destin O'Brien. Today I'll be performing Bottom from A Midsummer Night's Dream, uh, Act 4, Scene 1, followed by Sonnet 19. my life, stolen hence and left me asleep. I've had a most rare vision. I've had a dream. Past would have man to say what dream it was. Man is but an ass if you go about to expound this dream. Methought I was there is no man can tell what. Methought I was, and methought I had. <laughs> but man is but a patched fool if you will offer to say what methought I had. <laughs> the eye of man hath not heard. The ear of man hath not seen, man's hand not able to taste, his tongue to conceive, nor his heart to report what my dream was. I will get Peter Quince to write a ballad of this dream. It shall be called Bottom's Dream, because it hath no bottom. And I will sing it at the latter end of the play, before the Duke. <laughs> Peradventure, to make it the more gracious, I shall sing it at her death. Devouring time, blunt thou the lion's paws, and make the earth devour her own sweet brood. Pluck the keen teeth from the fierce tiger's jaws, and burn the long-lived phoenix in her blood. 
make glad and sorry seasons as thou fleetst, and do whate'er thou wilt, swift-footed time to the wide world and all her fading sweets. But I forbid thee one most heinous crime. Oh, carve not with thy hours my love's fair brow, nor draw no lines there with thine antique pen. Him in thy course untainted do allow for beauty's pattern to succeeding men. Yet do thy worst old time, despite thy wrong. My love shall in my verse ever live young. I'm Jasmine Wilde, and I'll be performing Viola's monologue from Twelfth Night, Act Two, Scene Two, and Sonnet Thirty. no ring with her. What means this lady? Fortune forbid my upside have not charmed her. She made good view of me. Indeed so much that we thought her eyes had lost her tongue. For she did speak and starts distractedly. She loves me. Sure. None of my lord's ring. Why, he sent her none. I am the man. If it be so, as tis, poor lady, she were better love a dream. Disguise, I see thou art a wickedness wherein the pregnant enemy does much. How easy is it for the proper faults in women's waxen hearts to set their forms? Alas, our frailty is the cause, not we. For such as we are made of, such we be. What will become of this? As I am man, my state is desperate for my master's love. And as I am woman, now will last the day, what thriftless sigh shall poor Olivia breathe? Oh, time, thou must untangle this, not I. When to the sessions of sweet, silent thought, I summon up remembrance of things past, I sigh, the lack of many a thing I sought, and with old woes, new wail, my dear time's waste. Then can I drown an eye, unused to flow, for precious friends hid in <clears throat> death's dateless night, and weep afresh, love's long since cancelled woe, and moan the expense of many a vanished sight. Then can I grieve at grievances foregone, and heavily from woe to woe tell o'er the sad account of four bemoaned moan, which I knew pay as if not paid before. But if the while I think on thee, dear friend, all losses are restored and sorrows men. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Kylie Scheib and I'll be performing the Jailer's Daughter's monologue from The no Two Noble Kinsmen, Act Two, Scene Four, followed by Sonnet 29.
Why should I love this gentleman? Tis odds he never will affect me. I am base. My father, the mean keeper of his prison. And he, a prince, to marry him is helpless. Be his whore is witless. <laughs> <laughs> Out upon it! What pushes are we? What she's driven to when fifteen months has found us? First, I saw him. I, seeing, thought he was a goodly man. He has as much to please a woman in him, if he pleased to bestow it so as ever these eyes yet looked on. And next, I pitied him, and so would any young wench on my conscience that ever dreamed or vowed her maidenhead to a young, handsome man. Then I loved him, extremely loved him, infinitely loved him. And yet he had a cousin. Fair <laughs> is he too. But in my heart was Palamon, and there, Lord, what a coil he keeps to hear him sing in an evening. What a heaven it is! When in disgrace with fortune and men's eyes, I, all alone, beweep my outcast state and trouble death heaven with my bootless cries, wishing and look upon myself and curse my fate. Wishing me like to one more rich in hope, featured like him, like him with friends possessed, desiring this man's art and that man's scope, with what I most enjoy, contented, least. Yet, in these thoughts myself, Almost despising. Happily, I think on thee. And in my state, like to the lark at break of day, arising from sullen earth, sings hymns at heaven's gate. For thy sweet love, such wealth brings that then I scorn to change my state with kings. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, I'm Sloane Shapiro, and I will be performing or Orsino's monologue from Twelfth Night, Act One, Scene One, and following it with Sonnet Number Eight. If music be the food of love, play on! Give me excess of it, that suffading the appetite may sicken, and so die. <laughs> that strain again! It had a dying fall. Oh, <coughs> oh, it came over my ear. Like the sweet sound that breathes upon a bank of violets, stealing and giving it odor. Enough! No more. Tis not so sweet now as it was before. 
Oh, spirit of love. How quick and fresh art thou that notwithstanding thy capacity receivest as the sea. What enters there of what validity and pitch soever, but falls into abatement and low price even in a minute. So full of shapes is fancy that it alone is high fantastical. Music to hear. Why hearest thou music sadly? Sweets with sweets war not. Joy delights in joy. Why lovest thou that which thou receivest not gladly? Or else receivest with pleasure thy annoy? It the true concord of well-tuned sounds by unions merry do offend thine ear? <laughs> they do but sweetly chide thee who confounds in singleness the parts that thou shouldest bear. <laughs> Mark how one string, sweet husband to another, strikes each in each by mutual ordering resembling sire and child and happy mother, who all in one one pleasing note do sing, whose speechless song, being many, seeming one, sings this to thee. Thou single wilt prove none. Portia's monologue from Julius Caesar, Act 2, Scene 1, followed by sonnet number 62. Within the bond of marriage, tell me, Brutus, is it accepted I should know no secrets that appertain to you? Am I yourself but, as it were, in sort or limitation to keep with you at meals, comfort your bed, and talk to you Sometimes dwell I but in the suburbs of your good pleasure? If it be no more, Portia is Brutus's harlot, not his wife. I grant I am a woman, but withal a woman that Lord Brutus took to wife. I grant I am a woman, but withal a woman well reputed, Cato's daughter. Think you I am no stronger than my sex, being so fathered and so husbanded? Tell me your counsels. I will not disclose them. I have made strong proof of my constancy, giving myself a voluntary wound here in my thigh. Can I bear that with patience and not my husband's secrets? Sin of self-love possesseth all my eye, and all my soul, and all my every part. And for this sin there is no remedy. <laughs> it is so grounded inward in my heart. Methinks no face so gracious is as mine, no shape so true, no truth of such account. And for myself mine own worth do define. As I all other and all worth surmount. But when my glass shows me myself indeed beaded and chopped with tanned antiquity, mine own self love quite contrary I read, self so self loving were iniquity. 
tis thee, myself, that for myself I praise, painting my age with beauty of thy days. Thank you. Number 16. from the Midsummer Night's Dream, Act 4, Scene 1, and Sonnet 35. When my cue comes, call me and I will answer. My next is most fair Pyramus. <laughs> Jardin Academy, Nancy Arnstein. Yeah. Um, from Mid Pacific Institute, Natalie Borsky. From Kauai High School, Kane Casillas. Yeah. From St. Andrew's Priory, Catherine Course.
couple a high, Kainua Dog. Pearl City High, Skylar Dizar. <laughs> From Hilo High, Mika Hashimoto. From Hawaii Baptist Academy, Kaylee Hayashida. <laughs> From Iolani School, Mariko Jersek. Hawaii Preparatory Academy, Elsa Moore. <laughs> From St. Francis School, Destin O'Brien. if there's another <laughs> From La Pietra, Sloan Shapiro. <laughs> From Radford High School, Jasmine Wild. <laughs> and then from Parker School, Erica Yost. Okay, congratulations to all of you. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. And now I'm going to um, give the um, top three awards in reverse order. Um, and I think I'll wait to say anything about the top award until I get to that juncture. In third place, the envelope, please. <laughs> From Iolani School, Mariko Jersat. <laughs> In 
In second place, from Punahou School, Kylie Scheib. And in first place, we have someone who's about to have a really fun adventure. Uh, first place winner in each of these branch competitions around the country, there are usually about 60 of them, uh, flies all expenses paid to New York City to compete in the national English-speaking Union Shakespeare competition finals. Um, that is held in the Vivian Beaumont Theater at Lincoln Center. And I've attended those uh, events twice. And they are uh, hard to describe. <laughs> um, I just want to, I know that the student's going to find out, and the student's family will find out what that's like, but most of us won't be going. So I just thought I'd share something about it. Um, there's usually about 60 contestants. There's a set of judges who do what we just did today. Listen to, six, you know, first 20 perform, then you take a break, then you have 20 more perform, then there's a break, then 20 more perform, and then there's another break. And then about 4.30 in the afternoon, 10 names get put on a board outside the theater and also posted online of the 10 finalists who will be competing before a different set of judges in the evening. Wow. Okay, so it's a, it's a full day. <laughs> uh, you can read a little bit more about the competition um, in your program, but it is always held as close to Shakespeare's birthday as they can manage it. And this year, it happens to be held on Shakespeare's birthday, yeah. April 23rd. So it's kind of cool for Shakespeare nerds. <laughs> Just know that. Um, <laughs> there's also in this, there's something a little different in this envelope. Um, third, third place had a, has a $50 check in their envelope and another certificate. Uh, second place has a $100 check and a certificate. Uh, first place has a check for $150 and a certificate and an 11 page letter from the ESU in New York City. <laughs> so there's a, a lot to attend to in a, in a few days here. Uh, there's something interesting I find about this year's <laughs> <laughs> uh, This we have a uh, we have this year we have a a repeat from the same school whose student won last year. So from Kaiser High School, Ruby O'Malley. <laughs> sort of dragged that out, didn't I? <laughs> okay, well, thank you to all of you, to all of our fabulous uh, students who came today from far and wide to uh, entertain us. Uh, thanks again. And um, let's uh, hang out. If there's any food left, enjoy that. And uh, chat. We've got the space for a little bit longer before they boot us out. And uh, thanks again for coming.